بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We will continue with the chapter of patience in which Imam Nawawi رحمه الله has brought a number of, uh, of ahadith regarding the virtues and uh, the importance of acting upon patience now Imam Nawawi رحمه الله mentioned a certain time or a certain place, or the hadith will mention this, Imam Nawawi Rahmullah brings this hadith, which shows a time where true patience is tested. وَعَنْ أَبِي هُرَيْرَةَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنْهُ أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ قَالْ لَيْسَ الشَّدِيدُ بِالصُّرَعَةِ Abu Hurair رضي الله تعالى عن, and as we mentioned before, Abu Hurairah is Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhar, who passed away in the year 57 or 58 after Hijrah. And he narrates many ahadith from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, uh, the most a hadith from any of the companions, he narrates 5,374 a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ. Even though Abu Hurairah عن, he was only with the Prophet ﷺ for about four years. Because Abu Hurairah he came later on. But despite this, he was so close to the Prophet and he was such, so attached to the Prophet ﷺ that he learned a lot of a hadith from him in these four years. And Abu Hurairah himself says that the Ansar and the Muhajirun, they were busy with merchandise, they were, they were busy with, with the markets. But I would stay with the Prophet ﷺ no matter which state I was in. Whether I was hungry, whether I was satiated, whether I had food or not, I would stay with the Prophet ﷺ and I would learn his ahadith. And even the Prophet ﷺ, he knew how eager Abu Hurairah was to learn his prophetic narrations. One time Abu Hurairah, he asked the Prophet ﷺ a question. And so the Prophet ﷺ replied, I was sure that, or I had felt that, no one would ask me about this hadith before you. So Abu Hurairah was known to be a student of the Prophet ﷺ. So much so that after Nabi ﷺ passed away, one time Abu Hurairah, he narrated a hadith regarding the reward of praying Salatul Janaza. Its reward is one qirat, right? And if you were to go to the graveyard, that's two qirats of reward. And one qirat is said to be equivalent to the mountain of Uhud. So when Ibn Umar heard this, Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala and he asked him that, are you sure you heard this from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So Abu Hurairah said, you, you really want to check? Let's go to Aisha. So they went to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and Abu Hurairah told Aisha, tell Ibn Umar that you heard this from the Prophet and I also heard this from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, yes, I heard this from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he mentioned this reward. And Ibn Umar said that we have missed it, we have, we, have, we have lost out on many qirat because he was not aware of this hadith. But this goes to show the memory of Abu Hurairah an. Now one of the reasons Abu Hurairah narrates a lot is because of the city he was situated in. Abu Hurairah was mostly situated in Medina. And after the Prophet wasallam passed away, there were two cities that were the hub of knowledge. They were the hubs of knowledge. Number one was Medina the city of the Prophet wasallam, and number two was Kufa in Iraq and we've mentioned previously that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was in Iraq and he was sent by Umar radiallahu ta'ala uh, he was sent to Kufa specifically just to teach the people of Kufa about the religion teach them fiqh and he created a, he created a, uh, a generation of students right and on the other hand in Medina al Madinatul Munawwara you had Sahaba the like of Abu Hurair radiallahu ta'ala and he had many students and his students were really close to him and they spread a lot of his ahadith from these students. Um, the greatest student, perhaps, Abu Huraira's son in law, is Sa'id ibn Musayyib. Sa'id ibn Musayyib, who is a student of Abu Huraira, and he's from the greatest of the Tabi'un, and he's also said to be one of the seven great scholars of Medina. So Abu Huraira, he narrates the Prophet وسلم, said, Laysa shadidu bis sura'ah. Sura'ah, as Imam Nawawi rahimahullah, he will later go on to mention. He says, وَأَصْلُهُ عِنْدِ الْعَرَبِ مَنْ يَصْرَعُ النَّاسَ كَثِيرًا The sura'ah refers to that person who can throw everyone down. Someone who's very strong, he's able to take everyone down. This is the person who is, who is referred to as sura'ah. The Prophet ﷺ says strength. Strength is not that person who can take everyone down. The strong one is not that person who has the ability, who has the power to take everyone down, who has that body. إِنَّمَا الشَّدِيدَ الَّذِي يَمْلِكُ نَفْسَهُ عِنْدَ الْغَضَبِ The Prophet ﷺ says, The strong person is only that one who can control himself in time of anger. When his anger overtakes him as in, and his emotions overtake him, he is able to control himself. This is truly a strong person. 
Now let's think about this hadith. Generally speaking, whenever we think about a strong person, we think about a bodybuilder, perhaps a wrestler, someone who's known to be able to hurt others, someone who's known to be stronger than others. But the Prophet ﷺ is telling us that's not how we should think. That's not the mindset we should have. Now, of course, it's good to be strong and a person should be strong. This is a must for a Muslim. The stronger Muslim is better than the weaker Muslim. But the Prophet ﷺ is telling us the truth that strength is not the strength of the body. True strength is the strength of the soul. To be able to control yourself, that is true discipline. And when you think about it for a person to become strong, what does it take? It takes a lot of discipline. You have to make sure you don't eat certain foods. You have to make sure you're working out. You have to make sure you're, you're, you're strengthening your body, etc., etc. It takes discipline. The Prophet ﷺ is telling us that even more than this, even more than this discipline is the discipline it takes to control yourself when you're angry. And this goes to show us just how difficult it is to um, control one's anger. That this has been this this has been termed as the from the Prophet as someone who is strong. And as I mentioned before, this is an area where even the most patient of people they lose their patience. Because when once anger overtakes a person, everything goes blank. Everything goes blank. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us, train yourself to control your anger. Just like you train yourself to become strong, just like you train yourself to be able to take others down, train yourself to control your anger. Help yourself gain this ability to, to of self-discipline and to gain this uh, this practice. Muttafaqun alayhi, this hadith is narrated by both Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim rahimahumullah. وعن سليمان بن سورد رضي الله تعالى عنه قال كنت جالسا مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ورجلان يستبان وأحدهما قد احمر وجهه وانتفخت أوداجه سليمان بن سورد رضي الله تعالى عنه he narrates that one time I was sitting with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم this Sulaiman bin Surad رضي الله تعالى عنه he also went to Kufa many Sahaba had actually left towards Kufa. That's why Kufa was also one of the hubs of knowledge because of the sheer amount of Sahaba that were there, right? And great Sahaba, not just small Sahaba. If you look in the books of history, when they begin to mention the Sahaba who were in Kufa, for pages and pages they keep going and they keep writing. This Sahabi, this Sahabi, this Sahabi, right? Check Tabaqat ibn Sa'ad for instance. Pages of Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum that went there. Sulaiman ibn Surad radiallahu ta'ala and he says that Kuntu jalisan ma'an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One time I was sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَرَجُلَانِ يَسْتَبَّانِ There's two people, they got in a fight. And they began cursing each other. وَأَحَدُهُمَا قَدِحْ مَرَّ وَجْهُهُ وَانْتَفَخَتْ أَوْدَاجُ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says one of these people, his face had become red. When the Sahabi radiallahu ta'ala anhum, he says one of these people, his face had become red and I could see his veins. Now obviously anyone who understands the description understands that the person is extremely angry. And they're cursing each other in front, and the Prophet is right by them. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ So the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said, إِنِّي لَأَعْلَمُ كَلِمَةً لَوْ قَالَهَا لَذَهَبَ عَنْهُمَا يَجِدْ now The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم has not just taught us to control anger, he's taught us how to control anger. He says, إِنِّي لَأَعْلَمُ كَلِمَةً I know a certain statement. لَوْ قَالَهَا Were this person to say it, لَذَهَبَ عَنْهُمَا يَجِدْ This anger he is feeling. It will go away. Whatever emotion he's going through right now, just by saying this statement, truly believing in it and controlling himself, this anger will go away. لو قال أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ذهب منه ما يجد. Were he to say أعوذ بالله that I seek refuge in Allah من الشيطان الرجيم from the accursed devil, ذهب منه ما يجد. This anger would go away. Now, what's the reason behind this? The reason behind this is because who gets benefit out of us becoming angry? Who gets a laugh out of it? It's shaitan. And so whenever a person becomes angry and this emotion overtakes him, shaitan will fuel that anger. He will add in whatever spice he can, whatever, whatever wasawis he can to fuel that anger. Right? The Prophet is saying if he was to control, if he was to say, A'udhu Billah, to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the accursed devil, then these feelings would go away. فَقَالُوا لَهُ So they said to him, إِنَّ النَّبِيَّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ قَالْ تَعَوَّذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ the Prophet وسلم, said, Seek refuge in Allah from the accursed devil. To which this person, as mentioned in another narration, he replied, min junoon. Does it look like I am? I am crazy. Meaning he was in such a state of anger that despite being told that the Prophet وسلم, is telling you to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he replied in this manner that, Does it look like I'm crazy? So from this we learn exactly what an anger can do to a person. And who is the one that causes anger? It's none other than shaitan. Because it makes shaitan happy to see people angry. Now this can be anywhere. It can be in the masjid as well. 
It can be in the home. It can be with your friends. It can be with family. It can be anywhere. Anger can always overtake a person. But the strong person is that one that in all of these scenarios, whether he's at home, whether he's with his friends, whether he's at the masjid, trying to get in the first saf. Wherever it is, whatever the action is, a person should have control over his, over his anger. A person should be able to control himself and be able to overtake this anger of his. In the next hadith, inshallah, we're going to learn a, a certain wording that comes in the hadith will indicate or will, it will allude us towards a verse of the Quran, which we'll discuss. When a person becomes angry, when a person becomes angry, the highest state is such that a person controls his anger in such a manner that the other person does not even realize it. The person won't even see that he's angry. He controls his anger to such an extent. This is the true level and to the true epitome of patience. Muttafaqun alayh, this hadith has been narrated by both Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. Wa'an Mu'adh ibn Anas radiyallahu ta'ala an. Mu'adh ibn Anas radiyallahu ta'ala an, he narrates, anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, man kathama ghaydhan, wa huwa qadirun ala ayyun fidahu, da'ahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala ru'us al-khala'iq yawm al-qiyama. Man kathama ghaydhan, whoever gulps down a sip of anger, what does this mean? That's the literal translation. Ghayr refers to an anger that overtakes a person. Now this anger can be small, it can be great. It can be very minute, it can be very severe. But this person, he controls it. Kaldama literally means tajarra'ahu. It means to gulp something down. Now if I'm chewing something, if I'm eating and I'm chewing, obviously a person can see me chewing, correct? He can tell I'm eating. But if I take water and I gulp it down, a person will hardly, hardly notice that water then went down my throat. The Prophet ﷺ does not say control your anger. He says gulp down your angle, anger. Meaning you control your anger to such an extent that the person you are talking with or the person your audience does not even realize you're angry. Man kadha whoever controls his anger to such an extent that he, he gulps this angle, the anger down. He controls his anger in such an extent, to such an extent which the person in front of him does not even realize that he was angry. وَهُوَ قَادِرٌ عَلَىٰ أَيٌّ فِذَهُ Even though even though he was capable of implementing it. What does that mean? This is a very important clause. Many times you become angry, but the person we're becoming angry at, we can't do anything about it. If it's your boss you're becoming angry at, right? Or if it's someone who has more authority than you, what will you do with this anger? The anger is irrelevant. You become angry, you have no choice but to control it. But this person, وَهُوَ قَادِرٌ عَلَىٰ أَيُّنْ He had every single, he had capability, he was able to, he, he was able to implement that anger. If he wanted, he could have got mad. If he wanted, he could have done actions which represented that anger. He could have done whatever he wanted. But despite that, when he controls that anger. Not only does he control it. One thing is when you, when you become angry with someone, you show them the anger, but then you don't do anything. But just to threaten them and to show them your authority, you show them a glimpse of anger. This person controlled his anger in such a manner where that person who was below him, whom he had authority over, he did not even show them his anger. دعاه الله سبحانه وتعالى على رؤوس الخلائق يوم القيامة. Now look at the reward Allah سبحانه وتعالى gives him. Allah سبحانه وتعالى will call him in front of every single creation on the day of judgment. حتى يخيره من الحور العين ما شاء. Until Allah سبحانه وتعالى lets him choose whichever one of the حور العين he wishes. Now look at the look at the look at the uh, look at look at the the action he did and look at the reward Allah gave him. We said this is al jazaa min jins al amal. We mentioned this last week as well. Allah subhanahu wa taala will reward a person in accordance to the type of action he did. This person, despite having the ability to act upon their anger, despite having the ability to enforce their authority and to fulfill their desires in front of everyone, he controlled himself. He controlled his nafs. He controlled his his his, his inner self in that situation. As a reward in front of everyone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward him with the highest level, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him any one of the hurul ain he wills so to, so to fulfill his desires. Al jazaa'u min jins al amal. The reward is in line with the action. He did an action in which he controlled himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will give you whatever you want, and not just whatever you want in front of everyone. You are free to choose. This is the reward given for such an action. And this also tells us the importance of controlling ones. Anger, Rawahu Abu Dawood wa Tirmidhi wa Qala Hadithun Hassan. This has been narrated by Abu Dawood at Tirmidhi, and Imam at Tirmidhi says, Hadithun Hassan, that this is a, a sound hadith. Now, this man kadama ghaydun, this wording, it actually comes in the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the people of taqwa. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Uiddat lil muttaqin The Jannah has been prepared for the people of Taqwa al-ladheena yunfiquna fi sarrai wa darra These are people who spend fi sarra in ease wa darra and in hardship Now notice over here the verse does not mention Do you spend money? Not everyone has money to spend Not everyone has money to spend But there are certain people even if they don't have money They spend time They spend time They spend whatever they, po- they could possibly gain but they spend it fissarai, whether they're in times of ease, waddara, or in times of hardship. It's not just that when they have money, that's when they give that's when they give charity. Or it's not just that when they're going through some difficulty, some calamity in life, that's when they turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they give charity. Now in all of their situations and all of their uh, incidents in life, whether they're going through ease, whether they're going through hardship, they're ready to spend for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the very next quality Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about al-muttaqeen. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the God-conscious ones. الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْبِ They are able to control their angers. The exact same wording has been used in this hadith, مَنْ كَظَمَ غَيْظًا They gulp the sip of anger. They control it in such a manner where no one even realizes. وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ Not only do they control their anger. One thing is when a person controls his anger and then he overlooks that action and he moves on. But he still has in the back of his mind that this person did this to me. Right? How dare he do this to me? I will never forgive this person. He still has that grudge. The next part of the verse is a step higher. Well, عَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ They forgive people. They turn a blind eye. Whatever action that person did, I forgive it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this doesn't mean a person has to forget. If someone has done wrong to you, you don't need to forget that action of his. What I mean by this is many times a person will forgive, 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 but at the end of the day, this will come back to harm him. If a person forgives and as a result of his, or he is very naive, and so he does, not only does he forgive the person, but he goes back to that exact same relationship that prior to that crime, that person will take advantage of him again. And that person will take advantage of him again and again, as soon as, as long as he keeps forgiving, because this is what people are. So it's one thing is to forgive, one thing is to forget. A Muslim is not naive. A Muslim is not one to be tricked by others. So if someone has done wrong to you, of course you forgive them. And every night we go to sleep and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take out any malice in our hearts for any of our Muslim brothers. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to empty our hearts of malice for any of our Muslim brothers. But at the same time, if someone has truly wronged you, it doesn't mean you have to go back to being being their friend the next day. Forgiveness does not mean that you have to go back to being the way you used to be with them. Otherwise, perhaps they might wrong you again. But وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ These people, they overlook the crimes of others. They forgive others. And it's not just they forgive certain people. عَنِ النَّاسِ is general. They forgive all of people. Right? Whether it's someone younger than them, whether it's someone older than them. Whether it's a, if, whether it's a friend, whether it's an enemy. They forgive each and every single person. وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a third level. وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who, who excel in doing good. Meaning not only do they control their anger. Not only do they forgive people, but then the ones who did wrong to them, they give good to them. And they do good for them. Now obviously I mentioned before that, one should not have this uh, attitude with someone who wrongs them again and again. But if someone truly made a mistake, then one should control their anger, should forgive them, and even go ahead and uh, do good for them. Right? Wallah yuhibbu al-muhsineen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who excel in doing good. The next hadith is again from Abu Hurair radiallahu ta'ala an. Abu Hurair radiallahu ta'ala narrates that أَنَّ رَجُلًا قَالَ لِلنَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَوْصِنِي A man came and said to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم Give me some advice. Now who exactly was this man? Uh, some scholars mentioned this man was Jari, Jariya ibn Qudama whereas, other, uh, other, uh, whereas others mentioned that it was uh, Sahabi by the name of Sufyan. Regardless, this Sahabi radiallahu ta'ala an he came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said, "Oh, Sini, give me some advice." In another narration, it mentions, "Akhbirni bi amalin yudhilun al Jannah, wa la tukthir alayya la ali aqil." He says that tell me of an action which will enter me into Jannah. So when he says, "Oh, Sini, give me advice," he's asking for advice regarding something that will take this person and enter him into Jannah. But then the person said, "Wa la tukthir alayya." Don't tell me too much, meaning don't give too much advice. La ali aqil, because I want to take something which back with me which I can understand. I want to take something back with me which I can uh, which I can understand. What advice did the Prophet ﷺ give him? La taghdab. Don't become angry. Don't become angry. Now obviously anger is an emotion. A person can't control whether he becomes angry or not, correct? 
something wrong happens, a person will automatically become angry. It's human nature. But what a person can control is the consequence of that anger. A person can control his actions after that anger. So la taqdib is a figurative way of saying, don't act upon your anger. Don't act upon, when you become angry, don't show that anger. Don't display that anger. Don't act upon the anger. Keep that anger controlled. Keep yourself calm and cool. Now this person who asked for advice, he kept asking again and again. So he asked the Prophet of Allah, give me some more advice. Give me advice again. Qal every single time the Prophet وسلم, said, لا تغضب, do not become angry. Nothing else. He just told him, لا تغضب, do not become angry. In the hadith of uh, uh, Al-Bayhaqi, Sunan Al-Kubra, this person who asked the question, he says, فَفَكَّرْتُ حِينَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم ما قال. I began to think about the answer the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم gave me. فَإِذَا الْغَضَبُ يَجْمَعُ الشَّرَّ كُلَّ And then I realized that anger is the source of all evil. Anger re- results in each and every single type of evil. When a person is angry, he loses his senses, he does things he would never do in an act, in, 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 in a, in a, in a, in, when he was sane. He would never act upon these things in the manner he does when he is angry. Were he to be sane in that moment? Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ is telling us, control that anger. Otherwise, if you don't control that anger, they will lead to crimes and crimes. Whatever those crimes may be. Crimes can be, once again, it can be at home. It can be over here in the masjid. Even someone is speaking ill to a Muslim brother or saying words of, of displeasure to a Muslim, something which may cause your Muslim brother displeasure. This is a cause, this is a great sin that results as a result of anger. And if we've done this, we have to truly ask for forgiveness. If we've done this, we have to truly ask for forgiveness. Many times, it's easy to, for certain people, it's easy to remain in constant worship. For certain people, it's easy to remain in constant acts of fasting, for instance. It's easy. But when it comes to controlling one's emotions, that's when things become difficult. Notice, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa multiple people came to him to ask him for advice. One of the beautiful things about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was that, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would give the perfect advice to the person who was asking him. Right? So when this person came to ask him for advice, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa didn't say go pray salah. He didn't say take care of your tongue. For this person, he told him exactly what his problem was. La taqdub, do not become angry. Because this was the root of his problems. And from this, we also understand that each and every single human being, although we all go through problems, but our problems are difficult. For one person, a certain problem may be more severe. For another person, a different problem may be more severe. This is not a means for us to look down upon others. If it's easy for me to do so-and-so action, but this same action is not easy for my brother, this should not be a means for me to look down upon him. Or to think that, look at this guy, he can't even do this much. Correct. And on the other hand, perhaps he may have an action which he can do, whether it's controlling his anger, whether it's controlling his desires, whatever that action is, perhaps he may have an action which he may be able to do, and I, might, I may not be able to do, to, to do that action. We should keep this in the back of our minds. Whenever, whenever we, for instance, uh, feel good, or we feel content at our level, we should understand that just like I have goodness in me, every single person has goodness in me. And just like I have evil within me, every single person has evil within them. Everyone has their problems. Our job is to overcome those problems which we have within ourselves. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa gives him advice, which is perfect for him. He says, La taqdub, do not become angry. And the person kept asking him again and again, La taqdub, do not become angry. Why? Because for this person, Anger was the root cause of all of his problems. Rawahu al-Bukhari, this hadith is narrated by Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah. وعن أبي هرة رضي الله تعالى عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أبو هرة رضي الله تعالى عنه narrates that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Once again we see Abu Huraira is narrating. Abu Huraira, many of the narrations, I believe in Bukhari there's more than a thousand narrations just from Abu Hurairah رضي الله تعالى عنه. So he's really, truly narrated a lot. And he was perhaps one of the greatest muhaddithin, if not the greatest muhaddith to have come in this world. Abu Hurairah was so confident in his memory that before Jumu'ah, he would stand on the member before the Imam would come, and in front of everyone, he would begin to narrate a hadith. Now, we've seen in the previous story I mentioned that Ibn Umar, عن, he actually asked Abu Hurairah, Are you sure the Prophet said this? So the Sahaba, عن, when, they, they, when they thought a person may have made a mistake, they were not afraid to ask. And we see this in the Kibab al-Sahaba, the great Sahaba, time and time again the Sahaba, they correct each other. Because this is not for someone's fame, it's not for someone's status, it's for their religion. Their sincerity to the religion was, religion was such that in each and every single scenario, whether it's their friend, whether it's their brother making a mistake, they will correct them. 
So the fact that Abu Hurair radiallahu ta'ala could stand on the member before Jumu'ah in front of all the Sahaba and he could narrate hadith after hadith and none of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala had to correct him. This showed how, shows how strong the memory and how, how strong the retention of Abu Hurair radiallahu ta'ala was. He says, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ma yazalu al-bala'u bil mu'mini wal mu'minati fi nafsihi wa waladihi wa malihi hatta yalqa Allah ta'ala wa ma alayhi khati'a. He says that a, a, a believing man, ma yazalu al-bala'u bil mu'mini wal mu'mina, a believing man and a believing woman will continue to go through trials and tribulations. They will continue to go through calamity after calamity, test after test. Fi nafsihi, whether it has to do with themselves. Wa waladihi, whether it has whether it has to do with their children. Wa malihi, whether it has to do with their wealth. Hatta yalqa Allah ta'ala wa ma alayhi fatiya. Till the point that due to all of these tests and all of these hardships a person goes through, hatta yalqa Allah ta'ala, he will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa ma alayhi fatiya, he won't have a single sin upon him. All of his sins will be erased due to the struggle he is going through. And this is exactly what we see with our brothers in Palestine right now. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease their suffering. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them victory over uh, the ones who are oppressing them. Wallahi, these people, we live easy lives. We live very easy lives. If you were to look, at the, look, look into what they're going through right now, the troubles they're going through, the children that are crying, the women that are left without their husbands, the husband that are killed off. These are our Muslim brothers. The Prophet وسلم, says that Al Mu'minunika Rajulin Wahid. The believers are like one man, it's like one body. If the head hurts, the other part of the body hurts. If a certain limb hurts, the whole body is it, 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 it's in discomfort. This is exactly what we should be feeling for our Muslim brothers right now. Right? In Palestine and across the globe, our Muslim brothers are going through pain and they're being, uh, they're being they're going through sufferings or they're, they're being oppressed for them this is a means of their rank being raised in jannah for them this is a means of their rank being raised because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all of their sins through this this is the hope we have from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the question is what can we do do we make dua for them do we stay awake at night and cry for them do we give charity for them right what efforts have we made for our muslim brothers who have a right upon us the whole world has left them but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never leave them even if each and every single government, every single person was to leave these people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never leave them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِلًا عَمَّا يَعْمَلُ الظَّالِمُونَ O Messenger of Allah, don't you, don't think, don't you ever think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unaware of what the disbelievers are doing. Allah, don't you ever think that Allah is unaware or He's heedless of what the oppressors are doing. لَا تَحْسَبَنَّ those who study Arabic will know that this, this, this form, this format with an extra noon at the end, this adds emphasis. Don't you dare think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unaware of the oppressors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He is only delaying them. He is giving them time until a day when their eyes will stare in horror. They won't be able to blink. They will come rushing forth. Their heads will be straight up. They won't be able to move their heads. They won't even have the chance to blink. Their, their hearts will be void. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Warn the people of that day when a punishment will come to them. That's when the oppressors will say, That our Lord give us some more time. At this day when, the, the, when these people who got away with their crimes in this world, when they go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold them accountable for each and every single crime they've done. At that point they will say, Rabbana akhirna ila ajilin qareeb. That, O oh Lord, give us some more time. Nujib da'watakim, we will answer your call. When attabi'ar rusul, we will follow the messengers. Awalam takunu aqasamtum min qablu ma'alakum min zawal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Was it not just yesterday that you would claim you took oaths? You would swear that ma'alakum min zawal, you will never cease to be. When you were on top of the world, you had all the power, you had all the dominion, and everyone was underneath your feet. At that point, you were prideful. You did not turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you would take oath, you would swear that we will, our kingdom will never cease. Our power will never go. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, your, in, your land, the very land you were in, there was a sign for you. You lived in that very land. 
in which the people who previously had oppressed themselves, the oppressors from before, they lived in that land and we took care of them. You've seen how we treated them. You've seen the punishment that came before them. We sent example after example for you. You were you you had all the you had all the chance to take advice from this. You had all the chance to see this, but you didn't. Because of your power and because of your kingdom, you turned a blind eye towards all this. And today they come back to Allah and they're saying, Give us some more time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, makaru makrahum wa indallahi makruhum. These people they plotted and they plotted. Plan after plan. No one knew their plan. Wa indallahi makruhum, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew their plan. وَإِنْ كَانَ مَكْرُهُمْ لِتَزُولَ مِنْهُ الْجِبَالِ They think they're doing, they're doing great work with their plan. They think they're changing the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنْ كَانَ مَكْرُهُمْ لِتَزُولَ مِنْهُ الْجِبَالِ Their plan is not even strong enough to move mountains. What will these plans do against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? فَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ مُخْلِفَ وَعْدِهِ رُسُولَهِ Don't ever think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will go against His promise to His messengers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill his promise to his messengers. Inna Allah azizun duntiqam. Indeed, Allah is almighty. Allah is strong. He is capable of taking revenge. Yawma tubaddalu al-ardu ghayra al-ardi wa samawat Remember that day. Think of that day when this world, this land will be changed into a different type of land. Everyone will come forth before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a plain field. Wa samawat The skies will change. Wa barazu lillahi al-wahid al-qahar. Everyone will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one, the strongest. يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ وَالسَّمَاوَاتُ وَبَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَحَارِ وَتَرَى الْمُجْرِمِينَ يَوْمَ إِذِمْ مُقَرَّنِينَ فِي الْأَصْفَادِ On that day, these criminals, you will see them مُقَرَّنِينَ فِي الْأَصْفَادِ They will be shackled, they will be chained. سَرَابِيلُهُمْ مِنْ قَطِرَانِ Their clothes will be made of tar. وَتَغْشَى وُجُوهَهُمُ النَّارِ And fire will be upon their faces. Their faces will be covered in fire. لِيَجَزِيَ اللَّهُ كُلَّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give every single soul what they deserve. Every single soul will see the consequence of their actions. إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَرِيعُ الْحِسَابِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very swift in accountability. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very swift when it comes to taking account. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets these people sin. Don't think that this is a blessing for them. وَلَا يَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّمَا نُمْلِي لَهُمْ خَيْرٌ لِأَنفُسِهِمْ Those who disbelieve, they should not think. Don't think that this procrastination, this time we have given them, خَيْرٌ لِأَنفُسِهِمْ This is better for themselves, that they're good. No, no punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coming so they can do whatever they want. They shouldn't think this. إِنَّمَا نُمْلِي لَهُمْ لِيَزْدَادُوا إِثْمًا Allah said, we're giving them time so they can increase in sin. وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ muhin. They will be given a disgraceful punishment. They will be given a humiliating punishment. So, those who oppress, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not unaware of these people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold these people to account. And on the other hand, those who are oppressed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears their cries. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears, hears their calls. And we hope that this hadith is exactly what is happening with these people, that tomorrow on the Day of Judgment, when they go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will go free of any sins. Because of the punish, because of the, 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 the suffering and the calamities that they're going through, whether it's their brothers in Palestine, wherever they are, Across the globe, these brothers who are going through these calamities, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring ease for them. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to, to, to remove these oppressors. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show us His power and to show us His, uh, his, his how, that when Allah, to, 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 to show us His power against these oppressors. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to take a lesson from this. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to cry and to care for our Muslim brothers. Just as this is a test for them, this is also a test for us. رواه الترمذي وقال حديث حسن صحيح الترمذي has narrated this hadith and he says this is a, a strong and it's an authentic hadith Imam Tirmidhi رحمه الله gives a term حديث حسن صحيح now often times when we say hadith حسن it means a level below صحيح and when we say hadith صحيح it means the strongest both are acceptable both are acceptable it's just a matter of how strong the narrators were but how does Imam Tirmidhi gather between حسن and صحيح this is an academic discussion, and scholars have given more than 10 answers to this. I'll just give one answer, and that answer is that when Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah, says Hassan, he refers to something broader than the category below Sahih. He says Hassan is everything beyond this point. Everything beyond a certain point is Hassan. Now that includes a Hassan hadith in and of itself, and it also includes a Sahih hadith. And that's why Imam Tirmidhi can gather between Hassan and Sahih, 
because for him the category of Hassan is much broader than for scholars that came after him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the to give us the ability to act upon what has been said. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring ease to our Muslim brothers who are suffering across the globe and to hold to account the disbelievers and the oppressors.